the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP. Time to show you my real power! Overly Intricate Combination! Hello everyone and welcome to the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP. This is Cody A.K. Marpix, and with me today are Deldris. Hey. Blue Sky Robin. Hello. The Red Mage. Good morning. And back from the dead, it's Carbonic. Hey, everybody, go by dashboard. <laughs> now on Steam sale. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. It's complete, right? Like you're done updating it? Uh, yes, yes, it's completely complete. I'm uh, washing my hands of that ordeal. And um, I'm going to be moving on to bright futures of new games and stuff. Cool. Awesome. Yes, like dashboard uh, visual novel. Yeah, yeah, uh, Dashboard, the feminine hygiene product. Dashboard, the da Dashboard, the sugary children's drink. And Dashboard, the tissue box. It's going to be like American Evangelion, where it's on everything. Like, literally everything. <laughs> dashboard, the socket wrench. Dashboard, the toilet paper. Dashboard, the flamethrower. Nice. Mm. Dashboard, the custom dashboard for your dashboard. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> All right, that, that's a good point to move on. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so keeping with the fresh memes around here, Yanfly has released a new comic, and this time it's about let's make a character. And uh, Yanfly, keeping with who Yanfly is, tackles it from a procedural standpoint. Um, not so much on the writing, but how on the characters you play should have meaning and their skills and equipment should have meaning leading up to the final boss. And by that, um, he wants you to work backwards and start with your antagonist. By creating a strong villain for your game, you're able to create a good conflict, and you should base the characters you have around the conflict going on. I think that's a good way to start the game because the game technically is about the conflict itself and the antagonist kind of embodies the game's conflict. Yeah, generally mm -hmm. speaking, it's good to build your characters around the world rather than trying to build the world around the characters because that never works. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> to everybody I gotta out say, there who's listening. <laughs> I gotta say... Out of all all of the plugins he's ever made, I think this is the most experimental one. It's pretty interesting. I haven't figured out how to install it yet, um, <laughs> but it's it, it's a really cool idea, and I think it'd be great to include in RPG Maker. Yeah, I mean, like he does mention, like first you have to focus on the final boss, and then next you have to focus on. What the fuck does your party do against the very easy enemy of the game, right? He's saying to build your skills around that, and you know what? I've been noticing that he, like, uses a lot of words in these comics. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's, like, there's a lot of information to be had. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's a bit of a heavy too, read for me. Too many words. Seven <laughs> out of ten. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> So it's like a Yan Fly presents Ulysses. Um, <laughs> Another thing that Yan Fly brings up in the comic is uh, something Robin just touched on. Uh, basically, the the way you should make your game is you just throw shit down and then make it work around it. You know, like with the final boss. Let's assume it has three hundred defense. Then you want your characters by the end of the game to have enough attack power and the right kind of equipment and maybe the right kind of stat buffing spells to overcome that 300 defense to actually damage the boss. And what I see from game dev, much like cleaning your room, it's very nebulous. You know what you want the room to look like, but you don't know where to start. So you just fucking pick something and then you work around it. <laughs> That's a, that's a pretty good analogy, yeah. I can dig it. Like, oh god, I don't know how strong to make my boss. Uh, 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 oh fuck, um, let's give him 300 defense. Okay, shit, now I get to work around 300 defense. Let's go. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a better way to do it rather than trying to just, like, blindly playtest around your character. Like, okay, so if the player at this point in the game is average level of 25, what are good stats for the boss to have to pose an accurate challenge for the players? And instead, you just kind of reverse engineer the entire thing. And much like the best way to solve a maze, start at the end and find the beginning, 
It's one of those things where you like when you think about it, you're like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. I should do that, but then I won't. <laughs> because that's not how I. That's not how I make games or how oh, I write stories. That's nice. Holy fucking shit! Yeah, I'm thinking this is why no one's finished the old collaboration project now. Because like, how? What the fuck do we do about the final boss? What's the final <laughs> boss? Just give him good stats. But but what about the rest of the party? Well, shit. I'm looking at, at Jan Fly's comic right now, and he's got some pretty interesting faces in it. I think you should put this face. Yeah, in the thumb. yeah, that's 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 a favorite everyone uses. He's got to be making reaction images for Fort John. <laughs> yeah. Gotta be, dude. His hips He's are moving on their bad. own. <laughs> oh man. Anyway, okay. fucking a. All right, so you heard it here first, kids. If you want to make good characters, don't make the characters. Make everything else, and then make your characters. Also, don't give them skills that are like useless overall like seriously i think that was another point he said no stat debuffs ever <laughs> they're always I mean, worth it that's not the game like like for example if you're gonna put like cure poison or something you gotta have enemies that have poison it's true yeah there are a lot of games um weirdly enough the one that comes to mind specifically is uh the game middens a lot of the characters have, like, three good moves, and then, like, eight other ones that you never use. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't really think about it, but yeah. That, I, there's, like, two or three that I used on everybody, and that was about it. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a different problem from, like, Fire, Fire Aga, Fire Aga, with that, right? It's a different problem from that. Yeah. At least with those, you use them at least one point. Yeah, pretty much use it like once to see what it does. Be like, okay, well, never gonna use that again. <laughs> oh, so just like the one gimmick boss that it that you use it on, and then after that, it's just worthless again. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I don't even remember there even were gimmick bosses in middens though. Please don't mm. put skills like that in your game, cause like seriously. You guys ever play the Paper Mario Sticker Star? Uh, oh, no. I've never played it. One of the things that that game does that was awful was... So basically, it made the uh, bosses... You have to find an item, and the bo the bosses basically get one-hit KO KO'd by these certain items. And the bosses are literally impossible to beat if you don't use the item. So, yeah, And that's that every boss. That sounds, like, terrible. So, every Zelda game. Almost. Yeah, like I was At saying, Zelda is awful. The Zelda things outside of the boss. Yeah, because you got like the big scorpion guy in a link to the past. You can use the bombs, or you can hit him with the hammer. You have a cho oh, You have a choice. I'm definitely glad I had the fucking spinner to help me traverse the world <laughs> after I was done with that dungeon. <laughs> Sir. Ah, yeah, that, that spinner. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. Was... Did Zelda predict sp fidget spinners? Say in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. But uh speaking speaking of of Zelda. Yeah, um big announcement happened uh, recently. Nintendo was coming out with the Super NES Mini, um which packs over 20 of your favorite games plus the previously unreleased Star Fox 2 into a little tiny package for $80 for scalpers and probably $200 for everybody else. Um, it's not worth it. I, I totally think it is, but that's because, like, every game I cared about when I was growing up, like, uh, Link to the Past, Super Mario RPG, Secret of Mana, Super Metroid, Street Fighter, uh, Mega Man X, they are on the SNES Mini. So this has everything that I liked as a child. Um, but here's the problem, here's the problem, and this is the main thing that no one really talks about for whatever reason, is that, like, once you're done with Final Fantasy III, and you're like, oh, maybe I want to play... Different Final Fantasy, you're tough titties, kid, because you're, um, <laughs> you're not getting any other games for this. And the pro the problem, the reason why it annoys me so much is, um, a couple of years ago, Sega released a, like, similar throwback console for the Genesis, yeah, where it had about like 50 Genesis games, but the most important part was it also had a con a cartridge slot, so. If you wanted to actually play a game that it didn't come with, you could. Hmm. 
Yeah. Also, so, I think it's a bit weird uh, that they're being like, oh, the previously unreleased unre- Star Fox 2, because it's possible to go out and play Star Fox 2 right now. But not officially. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, I, I've done a little digging into that, and uh, according to a couple different sources, the Star Fox 2 that is, you know, publicly available as a ROM, it actually uses a couple fan-made assets to make it run. Like, the Star Fox 2 that's out there is some sort of beta. It's not the master. And there is a a master cartridge that was made, and that was not found or released as a ROM. Yeah. Overall, I just want them to bring back the uh, Nintendo PlayStation. That was a really good idea that... I, I think Nintendo really flubbed up when they decided not to go with Sony and instead to go with Philips. <laughs> mm. And and thus the CDI was born. Yeah. yeah. We, it could have been great. It could have been great. Final Fantasy VI in 3D. I think their their choice in RPGs for, for the SNES Mini was pretty good, if a little surprising, because, you know, they've been trying to avoid... The, the Mother series for a long time because people have said, you know, localize Mother 3! And they even made fun of it a couple years ago at E3. Um, but now they're talking about releasing Earthbound Beginnings, which is Mother 1, so Mother 3 will be coming sometime this century. But, you know, if you look at it from, from like, Nintendo was trying to sell this, you know, to kids and to hipsters who weren't around for the original releases of stuff, Earthbound and Secret of Mana are very, very accessible as far as RPGs go, like, they don't have the big complicated mechanics, you know, I, I understand people are, are mad that Chrono Trigger isn't on there, but if you compare what you need to know about RPGs to play Chrono Trigger compared to the other two, um, I I don't disagree when they make Final Fantasy 3 slash 6 the most uh, complex system on that system. Yeah. And they've also got Super Mario RPG, which is Baby's first RPG. It's really yeah. easy. It's really simple, but it's also a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but the the most important game that's on here, of course, is the one that I'm pretty sure I am the only person in the entire world that's excited about is Super Punch Out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Super Punch yes, out. Super for the first OG one. I love Super Punch Out. I it's real. It's not a good game. Really, I mean, it's fun, but it's not good. <laughs> if you can't have Mike Tyson bite off your ear, it's not worth it. <laughs> God damn it. I preferred um, it when Little Mac was actually little. Well, he's not Little Mac anymore. He's, uh... He's Super Mac. Saiyan. Big Mac. Saiyan. Yeah, he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. He is Aryan as fuck. Oh, wow. <laughs> Something I, I am a bit, like, disappointed about is that they have Donkey Kong Country, which is like a, a must-have, but they don't have the second one. Yeah, two is like, definitely is the also best. also a must-have. Yep. Yeah. Also, I like that Kirby's Dream Course is on there. Like, yeah, I've played it, it, and I've beaten it, and it's fun. I, I would not consider it like an iconic Super Nintendo game. <laughs> yeah, wait. Especially oh. over, like, Chrono Trigger. Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah, Chrono Trigger, fuck that. Let's put on Kirby's Dream Course. Do they have an they... actual Kirby game yeah, in there? Probably. Yeah, they've got Superstar, which is still one okay. of the best Kirby games ever released. Yeah, why, why don't they have Mario All-Stars on there? Because that's just a collection of NES Mario games, I, I guess. <laughs> but, it's, but it's the biggest thing that was sold on the console of the Mario World. No, that's a lie, I just made that ever going to be coming oh, okay. to America? Secret of Mana 2. Oh. Never, never gonna get it. Nope. I guess if you're only looking to play first-party Nintendo games, then <laughs> this is pretty good. But yeah, and if you look at it this way, Carb, you can either pay three hundred dollars for a scalped SNES Mini, or you can pay four hundred dollars for a boxed copy of Earthbound. Why would you need it boxed? <laughs> just Why just buy it on the virtual box? console. So you can have something to hold it in. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I need it. I just first found the box. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Seven, $724. But how about Amazing. Free Pro? Wait, wait. Se- it's even more expensive than I joked. Yeah, it's $729. <laughs> um, 
Although I, I would argue that you're better off just getting a reproduction car- cartridge. Those are only thirty dollars comparatively. And then Nintendo throws you in Nintendo jail. What do you oh, think? That, do you think Nintendo Reggie's jail. gonna show up? Reggie's gonna th- show up, push you down onto the floor, and then eat everything in your fridge just because you <laughs> got a fake cartridge of Earthbound? Yeah, and he's <laughs> gonna say, "My body is ready." I say, if you get a fake cartridge. He uh, will show up to your house once a day. He just appears behind you and he gets in behind your ear and just says, my body is ready. And then he's just gone. And it happens to you once a day. <laughs> For the rest of your life. For the rest You're of on your life. Deathbed. You're on your deathbed. And it's the last thing you hear. <laughs> just surrounded um, by all your friends and family. And then no, like, no, at, no. As... <laughs> my, body, my body is ready. Not like this. <laughs> oh man! Uh, remember when he had kung fu moves? Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, I do. Remember that time they were Muppets? Yep, that was funny. Oh boy! Remember the time they they showed off Smash Four and he got BTFO by Hungry Box? Yeah, that was a good time. <laughs> yeah. Remember, remember, remember that time that he he lost to Hungry Box and they got really salty about it, and he's like. Separate. But, but you're not you're not the CEO of Nintendo of America, so fuck you. Pepper Farm remembers. God damn. Oh God. We're editing this part out, aren't we? I'm just imagining opening up your no, leave it in. Opening up uh your family like photo album after you've been cursed by stealing Earthbound. And it's all just that one picture of Reggie. All all of the photos have been replaced. <laughs> he's just photo bombing every single picture. Yeah, no, no, it's actually he's in every single picture now. <laughs> and like he's this right is an ancient you. thing. It, it goes all the way back to like your your great great grandparents' wedding photo. He's just there. <laughs> Jeez. The world ends, and all people can find are the photos of like your family with Reggie, and so it goes back to like. <laughs> old sort of tribal storytelling methods of yeah, passing yeah, yeah, on information. Right. It's like... Reggie, Reggie they, becomes a god. They told the story of the Reginald. <laughs> His body was always ready. Oh, shit. God, why why is he so close to the camera? Why is he so close to the camera? In this why is the picture? camera so close to him? <laughs> oh, on so, now, so, um... <laughs> Is there anything else about the SNES Mini? Guys want to say? My body is ready for it. Aww. If you want to have hipster children, I guess you can get them one of these. <laughs> I don't know. I'm having hipster children. I was going to say, I'm going to get one of these for the exact purpose of if I have kids someday, they're playing every game on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so don't grow up and be like, I was born in the wrong generation. Oh no! Don't <laughs> breed more people like that. No, and I already, I already have Deldris convinced of that because he was too young for Rocco's Modern Life. I think everyone's too young for Rocco's Modern Life. <laughs> <laughs> hey kids, if you're gonna watch Rocco's Modern Life, don't. Wow. It's too I good. Mean, it's a good show, but just don't. What What do you have for kids to watch? Rocco's Modern Life or Invader Zim? Oh, Oh, boy. I gotta say Invader Zim simply because, like, it came out later and that guy's a nut. Like, Rocco's Modern Life, along with Rugrats and Animaniacs, they did their adult shit right. You know, you had to be looking for it. (laughs) Oh, what? Are you saying you don't like the episode of Invader Zim where he removes all the organs from the kids at the school's (laughs) body and then eats them? So he can pass a so he can pass an X ray exam. You know, I think uh, Animaniacs gets my award for best adult joke in a children's show with uh, fingerprints. Uh, what? Yeah, fingerprints. <laughs> oh man, I I have to look up fingerprints later then because I have no idea what you mean. Mm. You're, okay. You're um, yeah. All right. So, but, but, oh wait, but but did you guys hear that there's gonna be an Invader Zim movie this year? Really? A yeah. movie? Wow! Who's directing it? Uh, Quentin Tarantino. I I don't know if he's <laughs> oh. Quentin Tarantino, Invader Zim. 
Did you guys hear about the Sonic the Hedgehog movie? What? Do you mean the one starring the Nostalgia Critic? No. What? Um, but the the guy that directed the first Deadpool movie, he was also the guy that directed the English cutscenes for Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. And uh, he, he decided to walk away from Deadpool 2 because of creative differences, and he walked straight out of Deadpool and into working on the Sonic movie. Oh, boy. I'm kind of okay with this. <laughs> do, do you guys know about that Sonic fan film that came out a couple years ago? So so there was this uh, live action slash CGI Sonic fan film um, that came out oh, a while shit. ago. Is it based called... on 06? I, I, I don't know, but it was called just not. Sonic. But, like, they never call him Sonic in the, game, in the movie because, I guess, copyright... They always just refer to him as the blue blur, <laughs> and it's it's um it stars nostalgia critic in it for some reason, and he's just there being himself. And they have this CGI Sonic in it, and it's like they've rendered every single quill on his body, <laughs> like realistically. Oh jeez. <laughs> I'm... It's just, when he moves, they all, like, bristle in the wind. It's really awkward. I would highly recommend you watch this just to see how, like, I not know. to render a classically 2D character into 3D. All right. And are we ready to move on? Yes. Ready. What, what about what about the other? Is Carb. There any other, other? Carb. Is Carb. there any other Nintendo news? It doesn't matter. That was a great talk about the Super Super SNES Mini, I guess. What were we talking about next, Cody? You know what should have been on the SNES Mini? That uh, Run and Stimpy game. No. <laughs> they were all bad. We're going to get into today's subject. Uh... Today we're talking about critical hits, uh, mainly because there are many games that just treat critical hits as kind of a cute thing that happens, but there are also a multitude that use them as an essential element of the strategy. Now, some games are built around it, and we're going to get into those in a second. Uh, generally, I haven't thought too much of them. I like, you know, Final Fantasy Tactics, where, like, on occasion you swing the sword, and instead of a, it makes a fa-ching, and the camera shakes, and it does more damage, and it's all cool. But you you don't really have to rely on it. We were talking in the pre-show about uh, games that did it well, and Robin brought up Ragnarok Online, where uh, Ragnarok Online still seems to be one of the best games ever made, and for this reason, it just stay it just maintains its number one spot on my list. Um, if you you can actually build your character around critical hits, like you don't need to focus too much on strength. You can just max out your luck and go. Well, this will crit. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a common build for that is like if you're an assassin, like you just get your strength up there kind of a little bit, and then you max out your agility and your luck, and then you'll hopefully hit decently like thirty percent of the time, which is okay because like crits in that game like ignore defense. Hmm. And you'd think ignoring defense doesn't sound like a lot, but there's way too many bulky things around the end game. Ah, it's interesting. Yeah, most mo most games and RPGs don't let you like. I guess it's kind of like a single player experience, so that kind of helps. I mean, I don't know it's like an MMO ish thing, but like you don't control like a whole party of people. So if you want to build your one guy to be crit monster man, you totally can, and it makes sense because hopefully your entire party isn't just crit monsters, but I guess it could be. Well, because like it works better for assassins because they have the fastest attack speed, the fastest weapons to go with the attack speed, and skills to complement it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so with the assassin class, the whole strategy is get lots and lots of attacks and pray that enough of them crit. Well, yeah, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, because like because crits like bypass the uh, defenses most of the time, they are very good at at like boss killing or imperium breaking where imperium is usually like this it's a guild versus guild thing there's an imperium it's like capture the flag except you have to murder the flag <laughs> or flag 
Imperium basically has infinite defense, so either you have to hit it really fast, or you crit it enough times, and then it'll die. Hmm. Seems like it favors crit. Like, well, crit people favor that type well, of mode. Well, I think it. I think it also takes like reduced damage versus crits, mm. aside from the like thing. But yeah, that's it's fair. Still, it's still decent compared to just a lot of ones in a row. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that's always very disheartening. Man. But one of the uh, there's an RPG Maker game that I played a while ago, and I actually don't remember the name. But they handled crits in a very interesting way in that basically how, how their crit system worked was you have you have an weapon, and while it's equipped, your skill with it is, it's kind of like Fire Emblem style where it starts at really low, but the more that you use it, the higher that your skill goes up. Which, and instead of like having a normal crit system, it's kind of like a, I don't know, like a gauge, I guess, because you can do a normal attack, you can do like a nick, which does like, 25% damage, you can do something in between, which is like 50, the normal attack, like something else, which is 150, and then Grievous Wounds are 200%. So, and that, that scale kind of slowly shifts from the weak end to the strong end the longer that you use the weapon. So there's points in the game where you're like, do I want to buy this new weapon and have to learn it all over again, or do I just stick with the weapon I have because it's working pretty good so far? You have, like, Spongebob with his little case that says All Reliable on it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, and it's just it's just a different, interesting way to do it, and that the whole, you know, it's not just, I have, I've been training with this, with my father's longsword since I was six. Oh, a shiny new sword. I'm just as good with this one, despite the fact that the weights and balancing are completely different. <laughs> All but, swords are created equal. But it was just an interesting way to, to uh, to adjust the the crit system a little bit, and I I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and it it does make sense because the more you use a weapon, the more, the the better you will be with the weapon. And instead of you know having it go, hey, your weapon rank went up from B to A, you do ten percent more damage. It's no, you know how to stab a motherfucker. <laughs> exactly. So I thought that was cool. That that's one of my favorite crit systems. I'll get to another one later, but that's that's one of my favorites. Fallout 4 also had, like, an interesting crit mechanic. They actually had a... So there's different kind of perk paths you can go down depending on what stat you want to be good at. And one of them is luck. And you can entirely base your play style around just being lucky and having lucky things happen to you. One of the perks you can get, actually, is instead of just getting a critical hit when you would normally, you bank it. And then you can use it on demand. And you can save up to, like, three of them, I think. Ah. That's really interesting. And you'll get other things where it's like... So, to get a critical hit, you have to fill up the critical hit meter, which I'm pretty sure you do just by hitting things. But you'll get other perks where it's like, when you shoot something, there's a 20% chance that it'll just fill your critical hit meter. Or uh, you have a chance where when you get attacked by a ranged attack, you'll deflect it back at the person and instantly kill them. And also have a chance to fill your critical hit meter. <laughs> or like, uh, sometimes the mysterious stranger will show up where during the... Uh, so Fallout has the VATS system where you stop everything and can target specific body parts. And you have action points that you can use to shoot or attack however many times. And if you don't kill something, the mysterious stranger might show up where it just plays this cutscene. Where it's this dude in this trench coat with a cool hat and a revolver, and it's like sort of old noir style music, and he just shoots the thing and kills it, and then it's like, Duan! and then he's then it goes back to your view, and he's just gone. <laughs> That's the best critical hit where it's not even you; it's it's plot. You <laughs> plot plot or not, or not even plot, just like something from beyond that just shows up and be like. Instead now, so, don't worry about it. So you're you're playing you're playing Fallout and you just have uh, McCree following you around. Is yeah. That, am I getting this right? Basically, McCree will sometimes roll in and like just headshot whatever you're shooting at, and then he's just gone. <laughs> cool. Okay. That's lucky. It. <laughs> That's lucky that this weird guy is following you around and <laughs> killing stuff sometimes. God. 
It's like you you instantly went from the protagonist to being like the side character in the mysterious stranger story. <laughs> Just doing my oh, job, boy. ma'am. <laughs> There's one point in the game where, uh, yeah, he shoots the thing, and then he looks over, and you're gone, and he's like, so that's what that feels like. (laughs) (laughs) What? Oh, boy. Batman reference. Oh, boy. Uh, Oh, jeez. Yeah, when I did my research for this, because I haven't been deep in the mechanics like you guys have, I've focused more on, like, the aesthetic elements. You know, for example, there's this one indie game... Uh, I think I think you guys have played it. It's called Pokemon. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the way they do it isn't optimal, but it, it's serviceable. So what happens is, like, if they have three special sound effects, like one for normal damage, one for uh, super effective, and one for not very effective. And what they do is they increase the volume and pitch of each if it's a critical hit. So attack, sound, the health bar goes down. So, whoosh, and then it goes down. Um... And then afterwards, it displays a critical hit. So if you're, you know, you're five years old, and you hear this weird sound, and the health bar goes way down, it says, whoa, what the hell just happened? A critical hit. Oh, man, that was awesome! I, I prefer Dragon Warrior or Dragon Quest style, where they announce it ahead of time. So it says, you know, whoever attacks, and then a critical hit, and you're like, oh, shit, it's about to go down. And it has its own unique, you know, animation for the weapon, because it, Almost every weapon has, like, a normal attack animation, and then the crit animation. And, like, the stronger the weapon, the cooler the crit animation, and then the damage. Yeah, Uh, because I remember back from, like, the original NES one, where it's, like, you go to attack, and then, like, the the screen just kind of, like, pauses, and there's, like, this quiet, and it's just, like, an excellent move. (laughs) And you're like, hell yeah, I did it! Are all your characters, like, ninjas or something? Because... Because they all sound like they came from their, like, nothing personnel. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the main character in Dragon Quest 1 is kind of, I mean, he... Ah, uh, fair enough, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's an armored ninja, but I mean, he still just kind of walks across, silently stalking the landscape, killing all that stand up against him. Is he the mysterious stranger? I mean, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Lodo's descendant is he just, everyone. He just pulls out the game. gun one day. Okay, this he pulls this out the not... gun. Fuck you, Dragon King. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the Final Fantasy Legend. There aren't guns here yet. Oh boy. About Dragon Quest One, um, everyone is honorable because they all fight in honorable one-on-one duels. That's true. Yeah. Even that that pack of werewolves where you take two steps and you fight another one, and you take two steps and you fight another one, and you take two steps and you fight another one. <laughs> they just one on one, man. It's like, okay, you go. I'll wait here. Are, are, are they mistaking you for a shiny vampire or something, or what? Uh-huh. Eh. I like that by the third movie, they stopped doing the effects for all the vampires that are supposed to be glowing in the sunlight. <laughs> Uh, they must have gotten enough of complaints or something from Teps. CGI is expensive, bruh. Yeah, because uh, they definitely didn't make any money off those movies. Oh, Twilight? <laughs> no. <laughs> God, I've probably brought this up like two or three times. I still want to watch the last Twilight film. No, you don't. <laughs> Why? <laughs> okay, the whole book is setting up this big fight between the vampires and the werewolves. The tension and the... It just keeps building. Like, they're going to do it. It's going to happen. And at the very end of the book, you have the werewolves over here, the vampires over here. It's about to go down. And suddenly, there's a knock at the door. A girl who you've never heard of, this character that's never been in the book before, steps in and says, Oh, hey guys, I'm a psychic. Um, If you fight, things will be bad. Don't do it. And the fight's canceled. <laughs> And the yeah, way, okay. yeah, and the way yeah. they handle this in the Cody, film, baby, trouble. What? I'm gonna spoil you on the movie. Spoilers for a bad movie. No one probably watches. In in the movie, that fight does fucking happen. They do go all out and they basically murder each other, and then it zooms out and oh, it's actually the psychic seeing the future. Yeah, and then the psychic leaves I... and tells, no guys, don't do this. <laughs> Don't don't tell me that fight isn't awesome though. <laughs> well, the fight is there, and I guess the, it's kind of, but it's still a terrible story. 
The fight scene is pretty all right, but like, <laughs> who the fuck thought this was a good idea? Like, God, man. Also, I like that whoever wrote Twilight knew fucking nothing about Forks, Washington. <laughs> like, Forks and LaPush are not within walking distance. Oh, I knew boy. that there were trees and that it rained, and that's about it. <laughs> oh, God. Such maybe rain, it's, much maybe fog. It's walking distance for vampires. Yeah, they just, you know, they do that, uh, that, that fast walk thing. Travel by map. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they fast travel there. Yeah, yeah all, all mythic creatures have fast travel. Duh. God. Robin, uh, what have you been playing lately that you can enlighten us uh, with the wisdom of critical hits or something? Oh, boy, yeah, yeah. I, there's a bunch of, of bullshit. But, like, oh, God, what do I want to start with first? Well, there's Fate Grand Order, and there's Monster Hunter. Those are the two big ones on my mind. Well, go, go, go. What you got? <laughs> okay, fine. Bring it. I, I'm, I'm figuring out which one to start with. Jeez. Man, okay. Cody, I really have a lot to talk about this podcast. I hope we have time, but, man, Twilight's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> Fucking Cody, edit that out or else. <laughs> no, Cody, you leave that shit in. You better leave that in. Carbonics isn't here to demand it be left in, so I have to. <laughs> so, Fate Grand Order. It's a really cool game. It just came out for for North America. It's a pretty cool game. Go play it if you want. I'm, I'm totally promoting it for no reason. And, oh boy, the crit system in that. Okay, it's a little tough to explain. But basically, you have a team of three. You, be, you basically pick who you want, and it's a team of three. And all your members have, like three kinds of attack, okay? They have buster attack, which is like basically mostly damage. There's the arts attack, which does a lot to help with your meter gain, because like meter is kind of important. And the third attack is basically quick, which is an attack that creates a lot of critical stars. And critical stars are like a big deal for the crits in this game, obviously. So the way it works is like, you do a round, and then you generate these crit stars, and then all the crit stars you gathered will be applied to the next set of attacks you do. Following me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. So each, each star has, like, a 10% chance to increase your crit. As long as you have, like, some amount of stars, you have a chance of crit. Here's the best part. If you have, like, 50, it will cap out all your attacks at 100% crit. And hmm. not a lot of teams can get to 50 within one turn, but there are like a couple that make it work. And I can tell you, it's very fun to have a Berserker running 100% buster crits. Uh, <laughs> because the crits affect the type of attack you do. So if you were critting on a buster, your damage is like multiplied like three times, and it's fucking glorious. If it crits on an arts attack, your meter goes up way high, like almost always caps out by then. And like if it crits on a quick attack, it's more likely to drop quick stars, uh, crit stars, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so you've used your quick attacks to build crit stars to use better quick attacks to build more crit stars. Yeah, but like, like the the current meta right now is like. Everyone who can make crit stars, give it all to the people who, like, can use busters a lot. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So Ooh. rather than just being it, like, just random chance, it's something that you kind of, like, build up. It's, it's something you can work on. Because, yeah. because, like, some of your servants, which is, like, what the heroes are called in this game, some of them are, like, very star gen based. Like, I have one character who's, like, his skill set is, like, he has a lot of quick attacks, and most of his kit is based around manipulating crit stars. So he can raise his crit genning rate, which, you know, more stars made. He can, like, generate stars on a whim and, like, give it to everyone else, which is amazing on some teams because, like, again, Buster Berserkers are amazing with crits. Different servants have different, like, synergies, and it's some work better than others. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's fair. 
Cody, but this no, is what happens when you put me on the spot. I fucking hate this. <laughs> How dare you he ask you to talking. talk on a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's still an interesting system, though, that it's, it's a separate thing that you can generate and build. It almost feels less like a crit and more of just kind of like a meter that you empty, or I guess you don't empty it, you just kind of have it to, to deal more damage. Kind of like the Final Fantasy thirteen break system thing that they did, where you knock them off balance and then you hit them with something and then their defense drops to zero and then you beat the shit out of them until, for like 10 seconds. Oh, the stagger meter? Yeah, stagger meter, that's what it is. But, I don't know, it's cool. It's a little too complex, I think, for me, because Final Fantasy Record Keeper is another mobile game where basically, I mean, there's crits in there, but they barely, like, ever come out, really. The The more interesting thing is there's, uh, like, abilities you can equip that change your that have a chance to change your basic attack into something else, or um, certain abilities to hit twice. So there's, like, a super good spell sword ability that will hit and then there's like a moderate there's an ability that gives you a moderate chance for it to hit again and so whenever that happens that's really cool it's not quite a critical hit but it does twice as much damage so it might as well be Ooh. yeah effectively a critical hit yep mm. yeah. yeah i told you the system i was talking about was pretty uh complicated yeah, it, it seems like the current meta being as it is, everyone is rushing to build up crit so they can just keep critting forever. I'm not that good at the game, I'm told, but mm. like, yeah. Okay, I mean, is that just like the simple strategy? Because like when I played Custom Robo, the simple strategy for me was I pick Javelin, I teleport, and I shoot a Gatling gun in the enemy robot's face. Like, I didn't have to think any harder, so I didn't want to think any harder. <laughs> Not using and sword storm. Do strategy. you even cheese? <laughs> the simple strategy is pick all your servants that are Buster gorillas and fucking make a Buster team. Have everyone use Buster. Buster all the enemies. Is this a Mega Man game? <laughs> That's how I play Mega Man games. <laughs> Mega yeah, Man's always the busting the enemies. Thing. Oh god. I mean, oh well. I haven't seen a busting this hard since the Ghostbusters. <laughs> Amazing. I oh, mean, can we talk about Fire Emblem for a second? So sure, yeah, right? sure. It sucks. Next. <laughs> yeah, well, it does suck. But anyway, um, jeez, shots fired. As far as like satisfying crits go, Fire Emblem has it both ways because because the crit animations are very very satisfying when they're your characters, and they're especially satisfying when you have some kind of like magic weapon that unleashes its power, or it's like you know Lin's critical hit, where it's just ridiculous but you know they make them feel really satisfying to land but then when the enemy with a 21 percent chance to hit and a two percent crit starts spinning their axe back and forth you get a little pissed off <laughs> yeah yeah i've yeah i've played one of the older fire emblems and it really sucks when a unit that's supposed to deal like two damage instantly kills you <laughs> yeah, because in Fire Emblem, crits do triple damage. Yeah. So, something that was the least threatening thing. With just killing blades in them. Uh, I did like how there were, you know, classes that revolved around being squishy crit ninjas and then just kind of regular ones. Because you had, uh, like, with the sword people, you had people like Raven, where they could use a sword. But then you had, like, mm -hmm. sword masters that were, like, smaller and sleeker and were just crit monsters so you had yep. your choice between the more durable guys like raven and then the little people like guy i believe yeah yeah i don't know for for a, real, a long time i kind of preferred yeah like the the myrmidons and the sword masters and all that but then after playing i think it was sacred stones just the the, the lancer guys where they get crit and they're like ow that was a good three damage i'm like you know <laughs> I'm I'm more in line with these guys. They're slow, but they can just march in and just kill everything by themselves because they literally never die. <laughs> Except in the desert, because the desert sucks. Mm. Yeah, the the big lancer dudes with the big bulky armor, clunk clunk clunk. You know, it's it's kind of sad that Fire Emblem's gameplay makes you do that because there's no real reward for its permadeath mechanic outside of the first one where, you know, people dying would unlock new levels. Right. 
But it's yes. part of the game. It's been part of the game for ages. But my yeah, realism. But... <laughs> now you can just turn it off. Well, they call it casual mode for a reason. <laughs> yeah, but here, here's Stop my view on, on it. Both sides. <laughs> here's, here's my view on it. Because I play it on casual mode for the sole reason that if I played it on non-casual mode, I would literally just reset if anybody died anyway. Because that's the that's how I play the game is I don't let anybody die. So I'm but not going to spend realistic. four times as long <laughs> playing this game when I could just play it the other way and achieve the same result. Yeah. If I played my... it straight and let people die, sure. But I that's that's not how I play my games. <laughs> I basically do the same thing. And my friend loaned me one of the Fire Emblems that was on. It was either the Wii or the GameCube. I forget. But he was like, yeah, no being a bitch and resetting if someone dies. And I did agree, but then on the second mission, my only healer died, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and reset that one. <laughs> yep. Oh, oh boy. I, I mean, the, the crits in Fire Emblem do keep things exciting because your character could die, but if they do, you know, then, you know, it's the the RNG is on a table. If you load the game back up, it's going to happen again. You got to reset the fucking mission. You're just, you're exposing yourself to pain. Lots and lots of pain. As if the world wasn't painful enough. Mosquitism. Uh, <laughs> if I'm going to have a love-hate relationship with criticals, or just, like, attacking in any game, it's definitely going to be XCOM. <gasps> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like, when I play XCOM, if it's a below 90% chance to hit, I just plan on them missing. <laughs> <laughs> and I make my plan around that. Oh, boy. That, that's accurate, yeah. though. Yeah, that that happens a lot in, like, Final Fantasy Tactics, too, where, like, I'll go up and they'll be like, you know, 96 chance to hit from behind. They're like, yeah, and then they miss. And then it's like a 61% chance to hit from the front. Like, well... They'll probably miss, but maybe I'll get it, and then they'll crit, and then they'll kill him. Like, okay, cool. I'm glad that presents me nothing in this game. <laughs> I liked in, in FFT, there's so much in FFT that's calculable and can be planned around. Like, there's a lot of mechanics in FFT, but they're all fair if you know what you're doing. And like with criticals, I think it can do anywhere between 50% more and 100% more damage. So mm -hmm. criticals never do the same amount. You know, they have like a, a, a variance in them, and... There's actually runs, like the solo Rams, a single class challenge run, like there's a certain fight where if you are Ramza as a knight only using knight skills, you have to use the ice sword, you have to get a max damage critical, and then ice two has to go off when you hit them with your ice sword in order to win a certain battle. Wow. Is this a speed run or what? It's a it's a challenge run. You're only using Rams of the main character, and he can only uh, be the class knight, and he can only use knight equipment and knight abilities. Ah, uh, oof. <laughs> <laughs> so time to talk about Persona. Uh, so Yay! Pers Persona always had cool critical hit looking moves, like uh, Chie from the fourth game. She she kicks things. So when she runs up an attack, she like just kind of does a spinning kick or something. But when she critical hits, she, like, runs up and bicycle kicks them and then, like, jumps up and kicks off their face and does a backflip before landing, and it looks fucking awesome. And that's what critical hits are like. Well, I think I explained a couple of podcasts ago the whole resistance thing and knocking enemies down in Persona, so I'm not going to go over that whole thing again. Mm -hmm. But a problem that Persona 3 and 4 had is that there were enemies that didn't have elemental weaknesses, so you couldn't knock them down unless you got a critical hit. But... As far as I remember, there's nothing you could do to influence your critical hit chance in Persona 3 or 4. You just kind of had to hope that it would happen. Hold but on, wasn't there like a status effect or something? I don't know. For, I must be imagining For critical it. hits? Yeah, like one of one of those weird ones like fear or something like influenced critical hits made it happen a lot more. Uh, Maybe you're right. I think it was Dread, maybe? Yeah, it had the weird name. I said, that, that sounds right, I think. So, I take it back. I guess you can sort of influence critical hits, but Persona 5 did uh, one more step than that. They added physical abilities that have really, really low damage, but have a really, really high crit chance. So, if they crit, you'll do about as much damage as a regular attack, but you'll knock down the enemy. 
So you can actually plan around uh, using critical hits to make up for any sort of element you might not have access to at the moment. Okay. Interesting. That sounds cool. And you still get the cool animations of, like, Joker doing 37 flips with a knife and then shooting a pistol. <laughs> and then, yeah. See, because I'm, I'm, I've just started Persona 3, um, for finally, so the only thing that I've noticed that influences my critical hit chance is how hard I mash the X button when I attack with my main character. <laughs> 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 well, be, because it seems like when I'm hitting it, he'll run up and he'll do his attack, and then he'll just keep smacking them over and over again with his sword, and that's a critical hit, I guess. So I just keep mashing the X button, and that works, and I get crits a lot. I don't really know. I don't that's, understand, but it works, so I'm going to keep doing it. That, that kind of sounds like an old wives' tale for some reason. I mean, kind of. It. It's, you know, holding up B when throwing the Pokeball, or down <laughs> B, or select. I mean, there's all, all kinds, yeah. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, mash A. Mew is behind the truck. If you mash X in Persona 3, you'll get critical hits. Like, <laughs> Yes. Speaking of status effects that influence our crit chance, one one of the games, also an RPG Maker game, uh, that probably a couple people have heard of, Lisa, does a really interesting thing with their one of their things. Because without without spoiling too much, because it is a cool game if no one's played it, but there's a drug in the game called Joy, and when you take Joy, your damage is like doubled. You crit ninety percent of the time you take, like, 25% damage. Like, you basically become indestructible for as long as joy lasts on your character. The problem is, and there's a number of characters that come, because there's a huge cast, uh, that come with a joy addiction flaw, and if they don't have joy, they don't crit, their damage is reduced to 50%, and they take 150% damage from everything. So you have to either keep them... Yeah, once they're in withdrawal pretty much useless um they can come out of it for a short amount of time but then once they're out of it they you know function like a normal character and then but that that withdrawal because the way that uh dingling has it set up is it's like a parallel event i think so it can happen like in combat it can happen out of combat it can happen at any point you hit joy withdrawal and you become functionally worthless in combat but there's enough well <laughs> i don't say there's enough of it to kind of keep everybody supplied but there's enough of it that you can keep it for the fights that matter, but then there's achievements for completing the game without taking joy um, and just dealing well with everybody's addiction and drawback. But it's just an interesting thing that you can do where you have something that gives you that massive critical chance and damage and all of that for a short time. But on the flip side, then you've got to deal with joy addiction. Because if you give it to somebody who doesn't have a joy addiction, they get one <laughs> after you give one to them. So, God. It's it's really cool. Um, one of my, one of my favorite ways to like deal with all that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good example of risk management. I think Fallout Three did something similar because there were drugs in Fallout Three, and if you took too many of them, then you would could get addicted and deal with withdrawal symptoms and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think I used Jet maybe twice in my whole run because that restored your AP. So I I'd, I'd go into VAT, strain my AP, Jet, bam bam. And like that was it. And I think I used one of the, uh, I used one of the stat boosting drugs once, so I could have just enough medicine skill to do something. <laughs> Fair enough. Take medicine skill. Oh. Make more drugs. I, I had a friend who played Fallout Three, and she was always addicted to Jet. She was never <laughs> not addicted to Jet. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fun time. I don't think I've ever actually taken any of the drugs in the game, mostly because I was I didn't want to deal with any addictions or after effects or any of that. So I was just like, nah, I'll I'll figure it out. I'll I'll deal with the fire breathing ants without it. You see, I I dealt with the fire breathing ants without drugs. I dealt with them via minigun. Yeah, fair enough. See, I, I like melee characters way too much in those games. Like my very first character was was a ninja, because I knew there was a samurai sword that you could get somewhere. I didn't realize it was from, like, the vampire guy. So getting that was a huge pain in the ass, but, like, that was, like, what I went for the very first time, was just beating things up with melee weapons. 
Did you get the power fist at some point? I did. The power fist. Power fist is great. Also, just, you know, beating things with random blunt implements, but <laughs> that works too. Yeah. Not 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 as, as entertaining as as the power fist, but Yeah. Speaking of grits and fallout, didn't one of you talk about like a laser or something in Fallout that had like a really good crit chance, but like usually did like low damage. I might be talking about the wrong game. I I think I remember that too. I just don't remember what it was. It was like it a plasma like... or laser something. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Brad was the one talking about it. There was like basically a laser, and I guess not a lot of people like using it. Yeah. Because it was like really weak normally. That, that was Fallout 3, yeah. He liked the laser pistols and the laser rifles a lot. They weren't quite my bag, mainly because they were a bitch to find and a bitch to find ammo for. I stuck with the legally not AK-47, the, the Chinese rifle, most of the time. Because you could find those anywhere. Yeah. Mm. But that crit rate apparently melts everything it touches, so maybe Brad has it. Thing going well, uh, yeah. If you if you crit with the laser, then the enemy becomes a pile of ash, and that's really cool. But <laughs> like, they were fun. They were fun. But I'm I'm with Red Mage where I gotta go for the guaranteed. You know, like I'm I don't want to fall in love with the laser pistol only for my last one to break or for my last battery to run out of charge. Yep. Yeah, I'm that guy that finishes the game with 99 potions, because I, I don't know when I'm going to need them. <laughs> I have to save them. Yeah, uh, same. They're just one of those things where you're just kind of like... <laughs> there, there was a comic I saw on it at some point where it was like, oh no, I'm out of MP. And then one of the primers like, use an ether. And it's like, I can, I have to save them. We're on the final boss! <laughs> you don't even know that. Then, I'm still like, mm, what if I need it later? What if I need it later? Yeah. I can, well, I can make it this round. As another form or something. <laughs> right? You never know. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Those JRPGs throwing curveballs, you never know when you're going to need those items. Nope. I don't know if you guys well, remember 8 bit theater, but there was a comic, like, probably a third of the way through. Like, Black Mage gets hurt. And everyone is telling Red Mage, Red Mage, you have white magic, heal him! And Red Mage is like, well, if I if I do, then I burn a slot, and then I'm less useful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, can, yeah. I can 100% get behind that. <laughs> yeah, so what he does instead is he starts, like, multi-classing into Beastmaster and trying to find ways to allocate his skills, and he just becomes a really good veterinarian after that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love Red Mage. <laughs> Also, just the part where they're they're stuck in the spider webs. He's like, well, here, let me just make an escape artist check. And he just rolls. Ah, 19. Cool. And he just hops down. <laughs> 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 and then Blackman just, I, I refuse to believe that just worked. And that it's just, it's so good. I love Red Mage. Mm -hmm. I wish I had magic that was powered by love. Uh, yeah, I guess so. That could be pretty cool. Did you just say love? Did you mean luck? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, powered by love. Because yeah. each time you use it, like, the divorce rate of the world goes up by 2%. <laughs> wow. It drains I... love from the world. I want, each like, time a... you use it, amazing. I want a class that is entirely centered around just being lucky. Like, just having fortunate things happen to you all the time. Like... The closest thing I can think of is there's a D and D class. It's like some third party Pathfinder class or something. Mm -hmm. I forget what the class name is, but the whole theme of it is like re-rolling things. Like so a bard. Well, no, not quite. And they can also uh, take critical hits and give them to other people. So the character itself is relatively weak. So if you roll a critical on like an attack or something. You can essentially just be like, oh, no, I'm just going to hold on to that. And then you have your friend who's like a samurai who attacks, and you're like, oh, I'm going to give it to them. And then they just automatically critical. <laughs> but it sounds like a nightmare for DMs because they have to actually make that make sense. Like, uh, my friend who's a DM was like, yeah, and somebody playing it, and they rolled a one to critically fumble. So I had to have them, like, trip over their bag and, like, tumble down a hill. 
but then they re-rolled and they rolled a 20. So I then had to have them fall into like a time paradox where they shot back out at the top of the hill, but with 20 more gold. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, man. Um, what an amazing hell hit. There's there's something similar to that in the uh, the tabletop game Sentinels of the Multiverse. Uh, there's a hero called Misfire. Uh, the way Sentinels works is it's a group of players fighting against uh, the DM essentially, who controls the environment cards and the villain cards. So it's a nice game to play with friends because it may take a while, but you're not playing against each other, which I think really kills a lot of those games. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, so anyway, Misfire. Uh, he gains a lot of bad luck tokens, and he stores them up. And then he's allowed to spend them on certain abilities when he has the right cards. So he can use a power that the more bad luck tokens he has, the more damage he deals, but also the more damage he takes. Uh, he also has his ultimate ability where he will redistribute damage um, that was done to the heroic party. So if the villain attacks and Misfire activates his special power... He can sack all of his bad luck tokens and send most of that attack back at the enemy. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, Jinx from Teen Titans. Her superpower is just making unlucky things happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's also, uh, well, not, not Teen Titans, but just in comics in general, I think Longshot was also someone who is just, just luck-oriented. Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. But the best, the best luck thing is: has anybody seen the anime Escaflone or the movie? I don't even know if they're in the movie. I know they're in the series. There's these two cat girls that are enhanced luck soldiers to the point where, like, when the main character like goes to attack them, like one of like the because it's like a mecha, so one of the servos like in the arm breaks, like. <laughs> Like, just from being in proximity to them. And, like, he tries to take a step back, and then one of the hydraulics and his leg goes bad, and the whole mech tips over. Like, it's just, like, how do you fight against that? Like, how? <laughs> I don't I don't understand. <laughs> That's why I really like uh, Nagito in Danganronpa 2, because all of his plans revolve around his ultimate luck. Yeah. Does he even guy. have a plan? I don't yeah. remember him having a plan at all. He he always has a plan, but his plans always hinge on his ultimate luck. Like, uh, when he wants to set up the plan at the very beginning of the game to uh, basically... Uh, has it been long enough that I can spoil stuff in this game? Uh, uh, pro, uh, yeah, yeah it, it has. That The uh, R1 has been out for way long. They've been warned. Sort of. <laughs> but people yeah, will still well, be mad at you for spoiling, so whatever. His, his plan at the beginning of the game, where he wants to start the murdering by murdering someone, and he wants to get cleaning duty in that old building so he can set up his trap. So he, he's like, he works in the conversation, okay, well, we should clean it. Well, someone should clean it. And so let's all draw straws to see who's going to clean it. And there are 16 people there counting him, and there is one straw for cleaning duty. And he gets it with no influence or anything, just luck. And that was his plan. I don't was remember to... this part of the game at all. It's the very beginning of the second one. It's like the first oh, thing that happened. Oh, the second one. Oh, well, Yeah, the then. second one. No, the ultimate lucky student in the first game is the protagonist, Makoto, who never really has anything okay, particularly okay. lucky so happen to him. Okay, okay, so it for me. Now fuck you, then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's okay. I, I kind of figured that would happen. The, the, the final, yeah, I, I won't spoil the final thing that he does, but his final lucky gambit is just, um, all right, man, that's it. Did, I did, like... did not, did not see it coming at all. And I was just like, holy shit, dude. dude. I, I shit my pants like five times. I could not believe <laughs> his plan. It was like, I, I could not fathom. <laughs> yeah, same. I would was, have never good. guessed in a million years. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, fuck God. you guys then. I have to play it tomorrow or something. Uh, Alright, yeah. so uh, one last thing about, about crits. Because um, I wanted to bring up D&D &D and then completely forgot. And we, we went over it, now I'm bringing it back. Uh, sure. Oh, yeah. Take it back now, y'all. 
Yeah, so D&D had a pretty simple system for crits, but it was fair. Uh, you have, like, bows, which only crit on a 20, but they do times 3. So, basically, your chance to crit is rather low, but if you do, it's going to sting like a bitch. But then you have, like, say, scimitars, which crit between an 18 and 20, or maybe a 19 and 20, and they do a times 2. So... You know, most weapons just, like, they crit on 20 and do times 2, but scimitars are the, you know, easy crit option, and bows are the mega damage option. Yep, mm -hmm. and, there, and there's, like, weapons that just kind of, like, run the gamut. Because you've got the scimitar, which deals, like, a six-sided die for damage, which is 18 to 20. And then you've got, like, the longsword, which deals an eight-sided die, so you have a potential of two more damage, but that only crits on a 19 to 20. So everything is kind of balanced against each other, because the things that crit more often overall do less damage. And then you've got the people that play with, like, the scythe, because it has a times four crit multiplier. <laughs> so yep. when you hit, you, you kill somebody. They're dead. Hmm. <laughs> See, the cool thing about about D and D that is, is something that was would be really cool to have in more RPGs, but it's really hard because it's hard to balance all that. Mm -hmm. Is the fact that you can build like any way, so you can build characters who were designed as crit machines. Um, in three point five, for example, using scimitars, you could get eventually build up to a point where you crit if you roll anywhere from a ten to a twenty. You have a fifty five percent chance to crit every yeah. single attack. Oh, and God. if you dual wield scimitars, you're attacking like eight times per round. <laughs> so you're pretty much gonna crit about four times every single round. <laughs> if not more. Oh my God. Yeah, not to mention there are like feats that turn your crits into like added added like status effects to your crits yep or something like yeah there's ones too where you can like reduce like their like strength by one in crit yeah that's that's some bullshit some dms don't like it's true yeah no i i played a crit monkey once and basically took a hill giant down to being weaker than a you know a toddler <laughs> so, yeah just in because the... and then he tripped on his foot and rolled down the hill and died Good night, Hill Giant. In the uh, Pathfinder campaign that I'm in right now, one of the people I'm playing with, he has this attack where he can crit anywhere from like a 14 to a 20. And if he crits, it not only doubles the damage of his rolls, but it doubles his strength and adds it to the critical damage. <laughs> <laughs> so he hits everything for like 45 damage while everybody else is hitting for like 10 Nice. And he just annihilates everything. See, mm. things like that are always really fun to see, but it's always real, it's always kind of annoying in games because I actually like because I've been playing D and D for so long that I'm I just inherently optimize without meaning to. So I take like intentionally like subpar builds just just so I don't do that on purpose. Like there's a barbarian thing, not really anything with crits anymore, but there's two like archetypes. One that gives you a bunch of damage reduction so you get hit and you don't take really any damage and there's another one that makes your rage more of just like a cold like fury like you're not you don't like freak out out of control but you're still really strong during it so eventually i've created michael myers from the halloween series <laughs> but <laughs> but instead of like wielding like a great axe or something else that's like really good he just has spiked gauntlets one because it's cool <laughs> Two, because that that makes him basically just being able to wade into combat and just never die, and makes it a little more reasonable at the same time. Yeah, because yeah. you, you could power game in and give him a better weapon, but you're there to have fun, not you know be right. the the guy. Exactly. If I wanted to I, be the guy, I could, but I don't want to. That's not fun. <laughs> I always love giving my character like one really obvious flaw, just because yeah. of the possible funny things that could happen. Like, I made this alchemist gnome, and but I was crazy, so sometimes I had to roll for madness. <laughs> just, just because I was crazy. I, like, okay. fucked myself up in an accident and lived out in the woods as a hermit, so I was super crazy. <laughs> I don't need a character sheet to mess with the DM, but I'm required to have one, so I make one. Um, all of my characters have the same underlying sort of imagination, so... There was one time I was playing Star Wars D20 with some friends of mine, uh, including Adam, 
and like we were we were infiltrating a ship and shooting at these people and I'm like I'm gonna flip up this table and use this cover and the DM was like okay yeah do that so I flip it up and I get plus two to cover whatever and you know we start banging these guys down and then I decide I'm gonna take one of the chairs with me and so I have this chair and I can use this mobile cover and then one time you know I can tell we're near the end of the ship and I'm like oh fuck we're probably gonna ambush aren't we so I, I tell the DM like hey I'm gonna throw my chair into this room and he goes okay you know I roll to throw the chair in there and the chair gets vaporized and we all go there's probably a lot of people in there uh, we should look for a way around um, <laughs> And then there was another time, more Star Wars D20. Uh, I'm going to keep this super short because it's Adam loves to tell the story. He can tell it later. I rolled to make soup, and I rolled a one. <laughs> and then the party died. <laughs> uh, it, basically, I got so mad at the can of soup. I did not go and get a can opener to open the soup. I just smashed it against the walls of the ship until it opened, and there was a big soupy mess that I had to clean when the rest of the party got back to the ship. Nice. Yeah. The, the, the only Star Wars D20 story I've got is I played a uh, tra Tranchidin, the lizard people. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a Star Wars like nerd, so I don't know. But anyway, he was a big lizard guy. And I had some weapon... And then at one point it like broke and I busted down a door and I began using the door as my improvised weapon for the <laughs> remainder of whatever, wherever we were. <laughs> and I, I did so much better with the door than I had ever done with my main weapon. I just kept the door and I just beat people with the door for the rest of the campaign. <laughs> That's what main characters are made of. <laughs> I knew a guy Lizard once. And doors who was making his character, and he was like, can I have 31 strength? And the DM was like, what the fuck? No. Why do you want 31 strength? And he's like, I want to wield a broadside cannon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you better let this happen right now. I was like, this sounds like the most amazing thing. Of course, the DM was like, no, you can't have 31 strength. Because <laughs> 31 strength in any other application would be overpowered and overwhelmingly useful. He was like, the only way I might consider it is if you write your character so that the broadside cannon is, like, magically bounded to your hands, and you can literally do nothing with your hands but hold the cannon. <laughs> yeah, because with 31 strength, you can throw somebody across the Grand Canyon, probably. Yeah. yeah. So he basically became a robot master. He's, he's what's-his-face from Wild Arms 3, the guy that rips the cannon off of the ship and then just uses that as a weapon for the remainder of the game. The big Native oh, American shit. guy. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, back 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 to critical hits. Um so yeah. Okay, so here's a question because I don't remember and I haven't played a lot of them and Carp mentioned it way early on with Paper Mario. That game right. has timed hits as does Super Mario RPG, which is on the SNES classic whatever it's called. But um were there crits too in that game or was it just just the timed hits. I believe I'm pretty sure it was just the timed hits. Yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting way to do it, too, is just to put it in the player's control, because I'm fairly certain from what I remember, when uh, Leo Hart was working on The Long Road, that was, like, one of the mechanics, too, is you had, like, a little timing mini game with your attacks. And I don't remember if he also had crits on that on top of it, too, but that's just an easier, more interesting way to do it. Uh, Legend of the Dragoon did that, too, with their little spinny grid thing. I played it for like an hour. I don't really remember, but <laughs> yeah. you had you had to do timing to in order to do like additional bonus damage with your uh, with your attack, which was basically a critical hit, but it was in the player's control rather than just let completely left up to random chance. Hmm. Mm. That would be cool. Where like the critical hits, like if you have like a spinny dial, right? Let's say a wedge of it. You know, if you get it in this wedge, it's a crit. Now. There could be a weapon where the wedge is a lot smaller, but the crit damage is a lot higher. Yes, mm -hmm. and now that you say that... Oh, go continue, but I actually have a more ad now that you say that, because I remembered something else. Alright, yeah, because you could reward skilled players for being able to hit that wedge, you know, reliably. Like, I... Exactly. I th I think that would be a cool way to do it because it would reward skill where a lot of games are trying to, to mitigate the actual skill of the player and make it a spreadsheet fest. 
but uh, Shadow Hearts does exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> like, as soon as you said that with the wedge, it's like, oh, yeah! I knew I knew there's another game that did that. Yeah, they've got, like, a... Like, you've got, like, the, the spinning compass, and then there's, like, yellow sections, which is, like, a basic hit, and then there's, like, a red tiny wedge that's your critical hit. <laughs> and certain weapons have a larger one, but they do less damage, and then other ones have a very narrow one, but they do a lot. Um, but then there's also, like traits and skills and stuff that you can equip onto the characters that and that change that you do more damage or make it wider that kind of thing see i'm one of the most innovative thinkers of 20 years ago <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> mm. these but. are these are like good choices for balancing critical hits but like how how do we balance critical hits because like some games have like a high chance to crit, but like the crit's not worth using at all. Like the damage multiplier is too low, or some bullshit like that. No, right? It, I think it's impossible because crits are a random chance to do more damage. And basically, if there's if there's a class that's based off luck, that's based off getting crits, and it's like PvP, people are gonna complain because oh man, you got me with a bunch of crits. And if you look at like TF2, right? Like. You have about a 2% chance to get a crit, and the more damage you do, the more ch the greater your chance to get a crit. So they're, they're still fairly balanced, but people still whine and complain about that because they died to something that was beyond their control. And, yep. and you know, dying to something that is beyond your control frustrates people, and that's why a lot of MMOs are going away from that. But it also makes them very boring DPS fests. So... Yep. Yeah, you have to be real careful because, like, variance and randomness makes a game fun, but too much of it also makes it frustrating for the very same reasons. Yeah. Mm. And so... Yeah. Like, I'd like to bring up, like, near Automata for this. Because, like... Not... Uh, okay. They, they, have, they have a crit thing as well. It's like, you, you can have plug-in chips equipped to your character, and, like, the very weakest crit thing they have is like adds one percent crit to your attacks and that sounds like bullshit but the crits in that game are like five times your normal base damage which is most likely gonna kill anything you fight if it's a regular mook and if it's a boss it's like three crits and they're more likely dead <laughs> fair like, enough seriously it's like weird as fuck a common like popular build is like to just use dual short swords and like stack crits and that's your melee attack because the crits don't proc on like gun hits or anything it's only mm. on your melee that oh, reminds boy. me of a uh, league of legends so league of legends has this system called the runes where you set up pages of runes which are stat boosts that you can apply to any character and you get them at the start of the game well some of the runes you can get are crit chance. And I've seen a lot of people, even like high ranking people, will take uh, out of the like 27 runes you can have or something, they'll take one rune that gives you 0.93% chance of a critical hit. Because if you get that critical hit it, within the first couple levels, like way early on in the game, you basically win. Because League of Legends is so snowball heavy, yeah. as long as you don't make a huge mistake, at the beginning of the game, if you get that one critical hit, that is half of your opponent's damage. And if you push them out of the lane that early, you win the game, basically. Yeah, you win the laning so, phase. So yeah, you have like a 0.93% chance of just automatically winning the game unless you <laughs> or somebody on your team does something really, really stupid. And and that that less than one percent chance will still piss somebody off. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the lower the chance of it happening, the more pissed people get that it happened. Like yeah. if I get hit, and it's a critical hit, but they have like a seventy percent crit chance, then like, well, no shit. But point ninety three percent. Like right. I saw a video where this guy was like, he had that rune point ninety three percent chance, less than a one percent crit chance two in a row and killed the person in two oh. hits. God. I could not fucking believe it. And if I was that other guy, I would have, like, tilted off the side of the earth. Like, I, <laughs> I would not be able to do anything for the rest of that game. Like, Yeah, no, seriously. Um, 
I was gonna say too. Now I know we we're kind of talking not to get too much into mobas, but see, because Smite, which is you know like a third person style one, has like items that are itemized for crit, but then they also have items too that protect against crit. Like there's I don't remember what the hell it's called because I, I never buy it because I I don't play defensive characters all that often. But basically, if you get crit, you get like a damage protection like you are immune to crits for like the next several seconds because one of the the gods artemis um basically every time she hits her her chance to crit goes up and it caps at like 15 percent so she has like a base like crit steroid and if you build items to it she can basically end up with like an 80 percent chance to crit on every attack which is bananas <laughs> but if you uh if you have that item she shoots you and she crits then you can't be crit for the next several seconds which just completely shuts down her entire kit so it's just it's just interesting that they take that random chance and be like okay we realize this is an issue let's put something in to stop that from being an issue yeah so you don't get hit with two crits on a one percent chance you know what right back to back yeah it, it helps mitigate it um and that's why like robin said earlier there are games where you can crit often but the crit damage barely goes up <laughs> yep. so yep. you can have a 50 percent chance to crit and do 30 percent more damage Woo! that's i think that's actually the rate of what monster hunter crits are like <laughs> oh shit but you actually hit a lot in monster hunter so like it balances out i guess <laughs> i don't know i have to run the numbers again i don't know i've only played the one for the wii so like i had a really just bad in general experience with monster hunter i need to play one that's not for the wii uh yeah underwater fighting is uh not great especially with motion controls <laughs> oh boy yeah no screw that but crits are something that sh see the problem is you want to have them be something that is there and is enough because you want the player to like count on it but you also don't want it to be so so pointless to the fact that it's not you know, not usable at all. And things that, ha like, uh, like in Dragon Quest we talked about, or in Pokemon, where you get, like, that visual and audio reward for it, really helps, too, because then it's like being a gambling addict. You're like, oh, got the jackpot, need to go again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, can I, can I just, can I just fix myself and then mention Fate Grand Order again? Because I just, I just remembered. This will be a lot simpler this time, I promise. Some characters are like, <clears throat> uh, shit, fuck. All right, give me a sec. Damn it, I lost my train of thought. Anyway. We are having technical difficulties, oh. please stand by. Fuck, you better edit this out, Cody, I swear <laughs> to God. <laughs> or else make we'll be here way. all Halloween. Right at this moment, make it like that cut where it's all the different colored right blocks, triggers. and it's like, eh, and like just the cut out real quick, and you just come back. <laughs> This is a test of the RPGMG alert system. <laughs> Fucking god damn it. Okay. In Fate Grand Order, like, there's a lots of kinds of, like, crit skills everyone has. Like, some of them are just create crit stars. And some of them are, like, boost your crit star magnetism. Because, like, all, all the different classes have, like, different rates of collecting these uh, crit stars. Like... Berserkers, as great as they are, have really terrible crit magnetism. But their crit effects are really high to compensate. And like some some classes like the archer or the assassin have like really high uh, crit damage, but like just middle of the road crit absorption. Like all the different classes have like different rates of collecting these crit stars. But you can manage it with some of the skills. Because my favorite Berserker is the one, is like Lancelot. And he has this skill where basically if you have any stars at all, he will collect all of them. Sure. <laughs> and because he's a Berserker, he has really fucking high crit damage. And because he is a bus he's a buster monster, I I have seen like him do like a million damage on his own in a turn when like most other characters have, like, 20k normally in a turn. So you're not exaggerating when you say he does like a million damage. When I say like <laughs> a million damage, I mean, like, 
a couple thousand off under a million, but it's pretty close. <laughs> so it is like a million damage. Yeah. Like, you know, 950,000, you know, somewhere in there. <laughs> like a million damage. <laughs> he's my favorite guy there because he's a berserker, buster, critter. I love him. Plus, he has a machine gun. Oh, well, there you go. It does like a million damage. <laughs> No, the machine gun does not do a million damage. His normal attacks do a million damage. That's why it's great. Oh, I thought you were gonna gun. say. Th- I thought you were gonna say the bullets did a million damage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if that's, you throw the gun at him, you only get about thirty k. <laughs> he would do a million damage if you had thirty-one strength and you threw it. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. All right, is this a good spot then? Oh boy. Yeah, I can't think of anything else really to add on crits. Oh, that wait. I haven't gun. said anything is bullshit this podcast. Critical hits are bullshit. <laughs> you know what I hate? <laughs> I hate stairs. <laughs> Alright. I hate stairs. God, I, I hate subways. I hate the train. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Left 4 Dead 2 advertisement of uh, that DLC, The Passing. Where they meet up with the Leopard at one characters, and Rochelle and Francis have this back and forth about hating things. <laughs> yeah, she's like, uh, I hate stairs. And he's like, What? You hate things too? And she's like, Yeah, I hate stairs. <laughs> she's like, I hate that bridge. And he's like, It's so stupid. And she's like, I hate your vest. And he's like, What? I don't think this is going to work out. And he walks off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. All right. In that case, uh, thank you all for listening to the RPG Maker General podcast of the RPG MGP. Uh, you, if you're listening to this, you'll be the first to know uh, we are going to be on hiatus for the rest of the summer. You will see us again for the Halloween special where we play a spooky horror game it made in RPG Maker. If you have any suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, this is Cody. We'll catch you next time. This is Red Mage. See you all later. This is Delvis, Spooky Pumpkin Man. Better win America's Got Talent. And this is Blue Sky Robin. Feel sad about those uh, Fire Emblem crits. I, uh, Cody, I heard that one of those crits broke your ass or something. <laughs> what the? F- <laughs> I say that I busted my ass at work, and this guy turns it into a month-long meme. This fucking guy. <laughs>